Welcome, everybody, to a Place of Possibility podcast. I'm Richard Del Monte. I'm Angela Wright. It's so good to be with you today. And today, we are going to talk about something that's near and dear to both of our hearts, and that is investing in real estate. Yes. And how does that work for a young couple, for an older couple? How do you make that work? Can I get some retirement income off of some of my real estate? Is it Let's just do a black this. hole? Am I going to go <laughs> Rich broke? Rich dad, poor dad style. Remember that gonna, book? <laughs> is it going to be like you know the the tenants from hell where you have to you know you have to worry about what's going on? Um, oh, we're going to cover all. I need to tell you a story about my bathtub. Oh, <laughs> at my rental house. Rental. Okay. Well, we don't want maybe maybe not on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Actually, it's kind of gross. Okay. All right. Oh, so boy. So you know, is is real estate? An important part of a portfolio or not? I mean, is it, is it something we should? Most people should try for doing owning. Yes, most people. I okay. So big old disclaimer. I mean, we can't speak for most people, but I think it it is a it's a great way to build wealth. In fact, I wrote down a stat before we came here. Okay, it is over the last two hundred years, ninety percent of the world's millionaires were created using real estate investing. Get out of town. So apparently, if 90%? you want to be, yeah. Real talk, I'll, I'll source it in the wow. show notes. Um, so yeah, apparently if you wanna be a millionaire, you gotta invest in real estate. Wow, that's crazy. It. But it does, it kinda, it speaks true to me, it rings true. You know, I think I think most people, uh, the, there's, from my perspective, there's two ways to create wealth over, over, over you know, a long period of time, and that have created wealth. It's either owning a business, yeah. which if you don't have your own, you know, small business or big business that you own yourself, you can own that through stocks, right? Yep. Equities, that, that's that's ownership of a business. Or real estate. Yeah. Those are the two ways. Putting money in the bank, sorry, you're not gonna get anywhere, as you can tell. It's gonna, under, under in current periods of time, with the kind of rates of return you're getting in banks, it would take you like 25 years to make 1% interest. <laughs> So I mean, in that's a lifetime, absurd. you maybe make four percent at current interest rates. Forget it's not. It. It's not going to do anything. Yeah, yeah. I so mean. you really need to have. So really, the, the if you have like a the old three legged stool, maybe it's five legs. What is it? Do you have we're getting have? more legs now. We're getting, but what, what would <laughs> but yeah, for you know, when you're thinking about and specifically like a retirement portfolio, I mean, that's what we're working towards this like future income stream, right? right. So we're talking about real estate investing from that standpoint. We're not going to talk about flipping houses and things like. You yeah, know, for no, current income, talking. that's yeah. not. We're going to go for like, right. how do you get some good retirement income, um, and you know, build equity in real estate investing. Right. So just right. you know. Yeah, flipping. Add, is if more you want to talk about flipping, yeah, there's probably another podcast. Yeah, probably that. someone else that could do that uh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So okay, what you got? You have your real estate. Right. You got your pensions. You got predictable sources of income like Social Security, pension, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. You got equities. You have fixed income. Yeah. Right. Those are the, those are the different. Those are the, the legs of the stool that you need to have to have a really good, well-balanced um, retirement portfolio or life portfolio. Yeah. And you mean you can even think about this in like 2008, 2009. You know, stocks and bonds both. Well, it, it was hard to find return in the markets out there, right. Right? right? But our clients that had real estate, like residential rentals, for example, those rents did not change during that time period for them. So it's a great way to get yourself another, uh, you know, sort of fixed, not guaranteed, but a fixed income stream that's not impacted by the day-to-day -day movings of the market. And yeah, it, yeah. It's a good idea. That's a good point because the rents, and in fact, in many cases, rents went up because people were losing their homes so fast they needed places to yeah, rent. Yeah, the rental market they went crazy during else. that they time They couldn't period. buy anything because their, their credit was and shot. Sadly. The time. Yeah, but. so, yeah, so, uh, so that's, that's, um, yeah. that's important to bring up. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember Cliff Notes? Who didn't use them? We're dishing out lots of great takeaways for you and realize it might be helpful to provide you with our version of Cliff Notes, AKA DMG's Know Your Possibilities Guide. To access the tool, download it and share it, just head on over to the show notes page on our website for this episode and have fun. Take notes and if you have questions, getting in touch with us is super easy. Just send an email to info at a place of possibility.com or call 925-736-6410. Well done. So how do you build a real estate portfolio? Oh, Wait, why not? So real estate is amazing, right? Like, I think people talk about this a lot and especially, you know, with the markets, like in 08, 09, it was a big, like you just do real estate. You have all of these books written about it. Oh, yeah. Why not just throw all of my money into real estate? I mean, I, I have people ask me that sometimes, like if it's so great, why don't I skip the stock market altogether yeah. and just do that? Couple of reasons. I, I took a minute to think this through before we came yeah. in. So 
liquidity is a huge issue in real estate. You cannot like, let's say you need to bail a kid out of jail. You cannot just, <laughs> well, today you can actually pop off and sell a house like yeah, this month, about an hour. but normally you cannot just pop off and sell a house and, and li liquidate some assets. True. I mean, it's a process and it costs you money. Yep. It costs 6% to sell a house. Yep. Um, Plus tax. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, you know, you have a lot of capital costs sometimes in real estate mm -hmm. investing. Mm -hmm. um, you have all of your money in maybe one or two assets. I mean, this is a great case for diversification. What if you had, you know, your rental properties were in Paradise, California a couple of years ago? Yeah, or Miami or <laughs> Baton Rouge or, uh, you know, the Santa Cruz Mountains and you have, you have the earthquake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. You, you really tend to lack diversification just simply because you don't have enough money to totally, you know, buy 35 houses in 35 different neighborhoods, right? Right. And yeah. then you have, you know, the headache, the nightmare tenant situations that steers a lot of people away from this sort of thing. Right. So. The repairs, the roofs, the overflowing toilets, it. all that stuff. That Ugh, all happens. Right? Dirty, dirty everything. Oh yeah. My I gosh. Mean, the rugs, everything's terrible. <laughs> so, you know, I, I like a lot of those things can be mitigated, but I think like the liquidity and the diversification is a huge issue. And it's why it's a portion of a, of a diversified portfolio for retirement. Right, right. so let's start so first. That's my disclaimer. Good, on. I think that's really brilliant because <laughs> you know it is true that um, what you say. Um, so let's talk about, there's two different groups of people we want to address here. One is just people that want to get started in the market. Yeah. And then the next group is people who are maybe more, you know, they already have their house and they're set and they're looking for other ways to invest more money. So let's talk about the people just getting started. Oh boy, yeah. You it's know, so hard for kids these days. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really is. I was just talking with Michael, one of our employees. He's, yeah. he's a millennial, he's 30 years old, and he's just like, I will never, like the income to price ratio that, it, that I, I'm looking at today, I will never be able to afford to buy. I mean, we pay him well, I swear. But like, the houses are almost $2 million. I mean, now. yeah, I, it's like there's a huge barrier to entry right. for these young people. Right. And so you've done so well with, with your kids and the advice that you've given our clients with kids. Yeah. It's amazing. Which we're gonna talk about. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so basically, so if you're gonna get started, um, you and you're a you know, younger person, First of all, you got to find a place where you can afford the housing, right? I mean, it, it's going to be hard to buy a house in Danville when the entry level house is eight hundred thousand yeah. to above up. But some people can. If you have two incomes, you can get started that way. It, it does work. But so the, the, if you're going to buy a house for your own purposes, for your primary residence, you can put down as little as three to five percent on a house. Most mm -hmm. people don't know that. But the downside, of course, is higher interest rates. You might have to pay. PMI, private mortgage insurance on the house. Mm -hmm. People go, oh, I don't want to do that. Hey, you're getting into the house. Yeah. You know, it's not the end of the world. So what? My daughter bought a house two years ago and she put down 5%, I think. And um, and the rate, the interest rate was like 5%, I think, for her first mortgage, which the going rate then was like three, you know, and it was like, that seems kind of high. But, you know, she couldn't get in otherwise. Yeah. So paying an extra percent, whatever. Yeah. You're getting your foot in the door. And then like in really easy comparisons, compare that to market rents. I mean, it, yeah. it's like you're going to pay that in rent anyway. Just go pay it and buy a house. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And have, have, your, have, your, have a stake. Um, Assuming you have that down payment. Right. So, the, so there are FHA loans. There are conventional loans through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac mm -hmm. that will give you three, uh, five percent down. Uh, the FHA does 3% down. I did, for my first property, did I did the 80-10-10. That's another way to go. Tell primary. about that. Yeah, so I put 10% down from savings that I had. I put, uh, we borrowed 80% and then we borrowed an additional 10% that was kind of like a second loan yeah. on the house. Yeah. And, like a piggyback um, loan, I think. Yeah, and this was, it was all co you know so conventional in terms of they were all 30-year fixed. We didn't get anything that was weird. Oh, good. things okay. that happen okay um and and you know that's a, a caveat of some of these like watch for um uh, balloon payments and things yeah. like that when yeah. you're doing in non-conventional 30-year fixed loans yeah right. but they, so a lot of them do work so look at them that's right um there are also some programs to get in like for the usda believe it or not mm -hmm. um i have a child that got into a house uh, uh by, with a usda loan that was basically nothing down Wow, she got nothing down. Yeah. Amazing. And the rate was like two. How do I get a USDA loan? Who do I have to be to get you have that? To, you have to go to a place that, that it actually is kind of, if you're build, if they're building houses in the outskirts of a town that used to be rural, USDA has an interest in turning those into. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And they you know, they're building rates. all those houses out in uh, like Mountain House, oh, Tracy area. Could be. I wonder if you're looking they out there, be. look into that. Yeah. If there was cows there before, the chances are, <laughs> or crops, 
the chances are, you know, um, you could get <laughs> you could get a USDA loan potentially. It's good look, good to look for. Um, there's also, you know, programs like my very first loan that I got way back when I was first starting out in, in real estate when I was like in my twenties. Um, there was a there was a city program that was a buy down that paid the interest rate down so they would incentivize you to buy there. Hmm. Believe it or not, the buy down rate was twelve percent interest. <laughs> Oh, but, you know, oh. the going rate here's, was 16. Here's your then. daughter complaining this, about her 5% loan. Oh, like, yeah. Just talk to anyone over 50. People should not complain. <laughs> Rates are like 3% now. There's nothing to complain about. If it goes to three and a quarter or four, who cares? It's still cheap. Okay. Another way to do it is with split ownership with your family. Now, there's all kinds of people know about borrowing money from mom and dad and stuff, but you can have um, a friend, an aunt or an uncle. Um, someone who maybe has a little bit more assets that's kind of already gotten established that wants to help someone that's trying to get, get established um, with a down payment. And so you can do that in a way that, um, but you know, you can either do that with, a, with a, a gift from a parent or you can do a loan from a parent or you can also do a, a split ownership. I love this. This is genius. Well, did you come you. up with this idea? I don't know. You did, I think so. I you? doubt it. No, I don't think so. I bet he did. He did, um, everyone. He did. I don't Go think so, on. but anyway, it um, it does it does really work well. It's a win win for everybody because you know when you when your parent is loaning money to your kids, you're like, I want to get those kids to pay me back. When am I going to get? Wait, them? so how, just explain how it works. Okay. How did you? How it works is we said, okay, we'll give you five percent down. These are the houses you can buy for five percent. Uh, we'll give you the five percent for the down payment, and um, let's say if you're buying the house for like let's say four hundred thousand, that means we're giving you twenty percent. My wife and I, twenty thousand, excuse me, twenty thousand dollars. And um, you pay me back whenever you want to. I don't care when. But when you pay me back, I'm getting 5% of the terminal value of the house. In other words, if you pay me back in 25 years, um, we're going to look on Zillow at the time and see, or whatever is equivalent, see what that house is worth. And I get 5% of that money. So I'm kind of going right along for the ride with you. Meantime, we're not paying for any fixing it up. We're not making any mortgage payments. We're not going to pay the property tax. Yeah. You know, you're you're paying for all that. So We're just you're getting a piece of a real estate investment without any of those pain in the you know what right. factors exactly. I was just talking about. Right. Wow. Have you come? Yeah. Has anyone paid you back yet? Have you gotten no. that far? They haven't paid me certain, back. Yeah. I think, but the thing is, they want to get rid of me because they don't want me to get. Like, for example, in the last year, the kids made like thirty percent on their houses. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I made thirty percent on my little five percent piece. Um, you know, I, I'm sure they're thinking like, oh, how can we get rid of that guy? Yeah. You know, or my, my mom and dad. And so it's, you know, it's, there's an incentive for them to get rid of us and we are happy to be gotten rid of. Right. You know, so you get your money. We back. don't care. And if they sell the house, you get 5% oh, of course, sell yeah. value. Right. Yeah. Or if they refi, you, you could put, you could put different agreements into it. Like if you refi and take money out, we're the first people to get money out mm-hmm. if you want. But in my case, what do I care? They're in a place that's really? growing like crazy. They're in Utah and it's growing like crazy. So like, whatever, take as long as you want. I'll this just is such sit a there great and, way to do it too, you know, because I feel like, you know, a lot of parents want to help their kids buy a house, but they're, they're worried about, um, you know, the affluenza right. issue. I'm blanking right. on the word, of course. Helping but, the kids, like making them cripple. You can cripple your children by giving them too much. Yeah. You know, I don't right? want to spoil them. I don't, uh, it, this is a great way to do it where it's a real loan from you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're not strapping them in terms of their current cash flow because that's a big problem for a lot of people. They become house poor when you right. buy your first house right. and you have no extra money for all these additional right. loans and all these people you borrowed money from. It's like, ah. Yeah. So they don't have to start paying on that 5%. Instantly. That's a great point. There's no cash for required for the kids right yeah and for the parent it's a win-win for the child it's a win-win um for everybody involved it's a win-win yeah. honestly it's I love a really it. good deal then so then so there's that piece and then um uh there's also you know the incentive like at that point you bought some rental property right yep okay so how much do you have to put down for a rental property 25 percent 25% down. So if you buy your own house, you can get in for sometimes zero down, sometimes 3%, sometimes 5% or a little bit less. But you cannot buy a rental for a 3% down or whatever. Trust me, I tried. And what else happens to the, on rentals? Higher interest rate. Higher right? interest rate. You're going to pay half percent higher? If At least, right. Right. Yeah. So it costs a lot more. It's the, the barriers to getting into a rental are much higher than if you're buying your own house. Yeah. That's just the way the system is set up. So... Um, you know, if, if you're buying a house that's like five hundred thousand dollars, twenty five percent is one hundred twenty five hundred twenty five thousand dollars. You have to have down. But how about this? How about we flip that on its ear? How about we say 
Um, you, you, you bought your house a year ago. Now you're in it. You're making payments. You could just leave your existing house, convert it to a rental, and buy another one for 5% down. What's the statute of limitations on conversion to a rental? I've seen, I don't, Is that's that the a right? good question. I, I think there are the some loans that have to say you have to be in it for a certain amount of time. Yeah. I think the USDA ones are that way, actually, like a year. I bet it's a year or two. It, it's not yep, longer. Yeah, but I've got a daughter who moved into her new house last November, and she's already buying another rental, yeah. another, another house that she's going to convert this one to a rental. So that's only been, it's only going to been, been yeah. like eight or nine months. One thing, one one thing here is you can't get sentimentally attached to your homes. No, right? You're not you're not no. buying your forever home and then converting it to a rental. I mean, you have to be thinking yeah. about it the whole time. And I will also say that if you're doing any repairs on a house that you know is going to become a rental, I mean, think about what you're going to want in your rental. Like we put these beautiful fl maple floors <laughs> yeah, into yeah. our into our yeah. first house that yeah. we and we knew like we knew we were going to convert it to a rental someday. We weren't thinking we did. The first tenant had dogs, which we allowed. We love dogs, but the dogs peed all over the maple floor, completely destroyed oh. it. And it was like, why did I have this beautiful maple floor installed oh, when any so tenant sad. would be happy with any kind of lamb? It. I mean, yep. you know, so just really think you don't do custom, beautiful things in a house, you know, is going to become a rental. Think about durability, easy to replace, low cost. Great point. Another point that I want to make is I would do this if I did it too over again, I would have never bought an older house because mm. they're just guaranteed, you know, stuff that has to be mm -hmm. replaced and remodeled. It's just all, you know, out, outdated. And so, you know, buy a house. The ideal, the sweet spot to buy a house is maybe three years after it was built. Yeah. And the people are getting transferred to another place on the East Coast or someplace. <laughs> yeah. They've already put all the money into it. They put the fences in, the yards, the, the, the window coverings. Yeah. It's all done. And then they just need someone to buy the you house. You got 30 years before right you're dealing in. with a roof or, you know. You got decades not, not to think about anything. Yeah. So that's a, that's a, good, that's a good way to do it. So, but, but if you buy another one, you convert your existing house into a rental. Um, you know, that's just a good way to go. I mean, I think the whole thing about not getting sentimental with your house is really vital. Just don't even bother unpacking. Just leave it all in boxes. <laughs> in a year, you're going to move I anyway. Mean, Who cares? Like, I, I would struggle with that. Like every, you know, yep. couple years move. Like if I'm trying to build my empire and I move every couple years, like not everybody can do that. Right. I think if this is That's a priority true. in your life, then yeah. yeah, you're into it. Like I think yeah. your daughter, yeah, my daughter you're is, into it. She's into it, but she's also, it's hard. It is. She wants to see her kids live in the same little house, yeah. they have their bedrooms, all that stuff, you know, and it's hard. It's very yeah. hard. Like, you you, you could do what I did. I mean, so I sort of like, I, I'm still in my first house that I bought that was supposed to be a rental. And instead, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm yeah. still living there. Yeah. Um, and so we ended up buying other property in other places where we could afford it. And so we looked up in Chico and it was like, oh, I can afford a house in Chico. And if it's going to be a rental, like I don't have to, there's property managers. You don't have to physically be present right. Right. Um, to do it. And even with 25% down, it's not that much. It was, I, I paid $220,000 for a five bedroom, three bath, single family home in Chico. It was, then this was, it was like, I'll just tell my story now. We were going to talk about it later, <laughs> okay. but here we are. That's I'll fine. Yeah, it. go ahead. So, um, what one of the things is one of our like tips for you is you know wait for opportunity to present itself. Mm -hmm. And so I had been sitting on a, I had been saving a little bit, kind of kind of waiting, but I didn't have enough for the down payment in when the markets crashed in 08, 09. And housing prices, I don't know if you remember, stayed low for a really long time. They did. So I got my act together. You know, I started looking at this in twenty eleven and. Um, is that what you bought? No, I bought in 2012. Okay. Wow. But I started looking at it in 2011 huh. and I, I didn't have enough for that 25% down payment. And I knew I wasn't going to be moving to Chico. We tried to, you know, finagle it and decided to just do the right thing. Yeah. So I had to come up with that 25 grand or 25%. I ended up using a 401k loan to make up the difference and, and a private loan. So I had all of these different loans, but the reason I did that was the opportunity. Like I struck while the iron was hot. That house was so cheap. It yeah. was incredible. And I just scraped all the money from all of these different, you know, 50,000 from my 401k private loan from somebody else. And then I had a little bit of savings and, and this is not her, by the way, she would never do that normally in normal life. She's very uh, organized and very methodical, but she saw the opportunity. And I don't take on, on debt. And I also, right, if, a, right. if you're a client and you've ever come to me saying, I want to take a 401k loan, your chin is probably on the table because <laughs> what I say to you is absolutely not. We are never pulling money out of your retirement. In this case, like the numbers just made perfect sense. And because the house was so cheap, 
um, and rents were so high, I was able to be cash flow positive on day one. So I knew that even though I was taking on all of this debt, that the house would support all of these different payments. So as you're as you're doing the math, and we have I have a spreadsheet that I made when I did this, so I could send it to anyone who wants it. It's like, Good. Um, you know, you put in your costs, and it just tells you how, you know what your cash flow, what your rate of return is going to look like over time. And and that was just a case of like I was paying attention. It prices dropped, and we just. Yep. did scrape yep. by do yep. what we had to yep. do it's been a phenomenal investment yep and thanks to the unfortunately thanks to the campfires it's been an even more phenomenal investment but you can't always know yeah things like that right so how has it worked out with all the with the ups and downs and the problems with tenants and and uh rents and valuations and all that stuff over the last it's been almost 10 years now right gosh yeah that's right Amazing how fast it, Ugh, oh, it was just yesterday yeah, i think yeah. yeah i mean you know we were um starry-eyed at first and decided to manage it ourselves we hired a local handyman who could be on site you know in an hour's notice for flooding water type things um but yeah there was a lot of hours back and forth a lot of downloading leases online <laughs> and i joined you know the landlord protection agency I remember that. there are yeah. reddit forums yeah. for landlords that are actually really helpful i totally recommend you check those out if you yeah. want to do real estate investing um and and we did it for a couple of years and then we had the nightmare tenants we there was mold all like they never used the bathroom fan so mold all over the windows of the bathroom all over the showers one bathtub was black like i don't know how you get a bathtub from white all the way to black the whole tub was black <laughs> the whole tub was black it's like they, they bathed in tar or something i i mean at that and then i had it and then i had one of the tenants say I have asthma and this mold is starting to bother me and I'm a veteran and I'm a veteran. And I was just like, <gasps> property manager. <laughs> I just yeah. thought I was going to get sued and rents. I had raised rents um, about 10% per year. I think that's another piece of advice that I got from you is always raise your rent 10% per year. As always. much as you can get, as much as you can get yeah, it. But right. well now in Chico, there are all these rules about how much I can right. do, but um Anyway, so by then the rents had raised enough that my net profit stayed the same when I hired a, prof a property manager. And now Brilliant. I pay somebody 8%. And I have to say is, is that that property manager, the first one was a bad choice. The second one was the best decision I ever made. And Isn't so finding a good one is difficult, but completely worth it. They do everything now. And they got my house turned over in seven days this year. Wow. I lost a week of rent. I mean, that's wow. just incredible. So all you do is just read the reports and Pretty, like yep, the rent. Yep. Yes. I sit here and read the reports. It's pretty painless, actually. It can be for sure. Yeah. I mean, I had to send, you know, a water heater broke down this year and there, that was a $2,000 expense. Like things yeah. happen. Yeah. Keeping a reserve fund. Important. important. Yeah. Yeah. A certain yeah. percentage of the rents you get, you should be putting into a side fund for capital improvements at the very least, you know, yeah. like, or, or vacancies and things like that. You could also use home warranties. They're, yeah. they're not the best thing in the world, like any insurance, eh, they have their problems. Yeah. But but if you, you know, if a broken water heater would break you, paying the $40 a month for a home warranty is a really good idea. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And they just send a re someone up there to fix it, it costs you 50, 60 dollars. It's 100 now it's for 100? the, yeah, okay, for, for the repair. Fee but you know, repair. if they break something or the refrigerator goes out or whatever. Totally worth it. It's totally worth it, yeah, for sure. So if, buying the houses, so I mean, I think if, it makes sense to be able to keep repeating and buying new houses if you if you have the stomach for it. So now I have $90,000 in equity sitting in that house. Yeah. And it's like, I. Now I've got to pull that out and do something with it. And yep. the only reason that I've kind of paused is that I mean, we're at all time crazy highs in the market yep. and it's not the right time to buy. Could my, be, right. In yeah. my opinion. right, right, yeah. <laughs> that opinion, grains of salt, everybody. I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I'm seeing like when you get into multiple offer situations, I think you do end up paying more than, yeah. you know, market price. And, yeah. and so I might wait. But now I'm looking at that saying, what? it's just sitting there doing nothing. Why don't I leverage that into another property? Yeah, ninety thousand dollars is, you know, twenty five percent of what three sixty or something, uh, three eighty, whatever. Um, so that's you. You could, probably couldn't buy. Maybe you could buy in Sacramento, or I go out of state, like or you go out of state. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people get afraid of buying property out of state because you're not there to witness everything that's happening. But property managers are, you know, the ones that are worth their salt are good at their jobs, and they want your property to to keep its value. Right. Um, and you there don't miss out on an opportunity to invest in real estate simply because it's not in your home state. I mean, you look at Arizona, I got I buy houses for a hundred thousand dollars out there still. Yep. And, yep. and they're in towns where people are mm -hmm. renting. So there's lots of opportunity. Yeah. A year ago, you could buy homes for, I think it was 120,000 in Idaho. Wow. 
120,000, brand new. The California exodus might have. Yeah, might have run up to maybe 150 or 160. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's amazing that there are, you know, really good deals in other states that are you know, make them very attractive to buy things. Now, we are talking about taking on a lot of debt. Sure, yeah. Okay. That, so that's how do you, thing. like, let's say all my tenants vacate. Like, how do you mitigate that? What other factors should we be considering? You need to have some backup. So, like, if you, yeah. you have to have your 401k plan where you can get money at, for example, or if you're... If you're I, have a, I have, like, a, a capital account for those. Yeah, you should. Like, little savings. But if you if, like, some people don't want to buy a new house, their first house, until they have all these things in place. I wouldn't want... You know, when I bought my first house with my wife, we got, we got oh, we have this little check we got from work. It was $25. Let's put it in the house. We needed every penny. We came out of it. We had nothing left. You know, yeah. we were, like, broke. Yeah. But we were just like, okay, we're doing it. You know? Well, so. yeah, because I think, like, you know, the worst case scenario is, you know, you lose tenants. You can't, you can't pay the mortgage. You have to sell the house. Yeah. So how is that worse than where you started with no house? <laughs> you're just back where you started. You're back where you started. Or you're yeah. back where you started with a little bit of extra cash from the equity that you built in the home yeah. during the time that you owned it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people often forget, like, do you just go back to where you started? <laughs> you yeah. know what? I mean, okay, there are, there are extreme cases where, you know, I don't know, you don't buy insurance and the house, the tenants flood the house. I don't know, you can lose yeah. money. Yeah. But. I had They're a lot so of successes rare. in real estate over the years, but there's one that I've also had the biggest flame out failure in real estate also. So like 1992, uh, when I got married to my wife, we bought our first house in San Ramon for 235. And I thought, I am in debt up for a quarter of a million dollars. I'm never going to get out of this. I was so terrified. <laughs> and so the house, we had the house Sweet and we moved. summer child. <laughs> We made it into we made it into a rental after a few years. We bought another house in Danville, and we were there for a while. And that house was not really going anywhere. It wasn't going up. It was kind of going sideways. And we had we had built up some credit card debt. And my wife said, "Just sell that house. Let's get let's get the pay the credit card off." I'm like I don't want to do that. I just don't want to do it. No, no, let's sell it. So um, I don't want to throw under the bus. bus. Here. I don't want to throw under the bus. We I this jointly is all decided to do it. Fault. No, 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 not at all. I jointly decided to do it, and. Um, and that house now is worth like 1.2 million. And what are the, I bet the rents on and that house. Who knows five what the rents would have been? I mean, the rents for 1,200 a month, then it's probably 4,000. You know, so I mean, that's the downside if you don't if you don't buy. You know, and the other thing people worry about is at the peak of the market and all that stuff. Yes, you know, I had a, I had a coach, Tracy. You know, a business coach. Because um, at one point, this house that we bought that we're staying in um, was. Um, it went up so much money, like right when we first bought it. And I thought, this market is going to crash. It's just too, I mean, it went up 20. You thought that? I did, I thought because it went up 20% in like six months. <sighs> and I went to, you and I both went to school in Chico. So I always wanted to live in Chico. I just wanted to go back there. I was loving, you know, re recreate the whole thing. And so um, my coach said, you know, you can't stay in business in the Bay Area and live in Chico. You can come down there. And I was like, oh, I'll come down and see, be, you know, have a little office there. I can come and visit people. She goes, you can't do that. You have to be in the community that you that you work in. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, what about this market going down? She said, look, can you afford to live through the market if it, when it goes down? I said, yeah, I can make the payments and everything. She goes, okay. Do you think that prices are going to be higher 20 years from now than they are now? I'm like, of course. She goes, okay, then don't think about it. And of course, the house went down a lot. Yeah. Like 30, 40, 30%. Ugh, yeah. And I was like, I knew it. I knew it. You know, and all that happened. But but uh, we just stayed the course. Everything worked out. You, you know. know, I never think about the value of my primary residence mm. in terms of what's happening with the current market. Really? Rarely. Huh. I mean, so occasionally you calculate your net worth, you know, yeah. whatever. But but I don't because that to me is not an investment. It's a use asset. My oh. primary residence is a use asset. Okay. And as long as I, like you said, as long as I can make those mortgage payments, I don't care what's happening with my equity in that house unless I need money for something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, then you might care. I got debt or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. if you if I don't have need equity to do something and and I'm not trying to sell the house, it's a use like because to you know to realize the return on my investment, I have to sell my house, then I have nowhere to live. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's right. so I don't, yeah. you can't kick yourself when your primary residence is bouncing around, right? That's, yeah. that to me is not an investment. Right. It will, it will earn money over time. It will, you know, but, it will. but I, I caution people to, against thinking about their primary residence as, as an investment, unless you're doing the property ladder thing, right? right? Then it's a little bit different, but that's not your, that's, my residence for a while that I'm converting to a rental, not, you know, where I'm raising right. my family. It's right. a different story to me. Right, right. 
Okay, so when opportunities present, right. So the, so this is where I've, I've actually made some mistakes in, in, the, in the past, um, is not taking, not tapping into equity on real estate that that's rental real estate that we own for investment purposes yeah. and and buying more things with it. I, I've, I have to admit that there was a period of time when I thought that getting these pro- rental properties paid off is a, is a wise thing to do. Then I get to keep all the money. And I had a, I had a really good friend that I trust who's in the market, you know, he's in the commercial uh, and re- residential real estate market. And he said, Richard, you're blowing it, man. You should never have more than 25% equity in all those rental properties. In other words, you should have 75% leverage at all times. And I thought, what? That's against everything I've ever been taught. I know, right? It's like crazy. <laughs> but, you know, um, and if you're more conservative, let's say you should keep it 60-40. So you have 40% equity if you want to do that. But um, but you really should have it be leveraged all the time because it, things are prices are always going up. Rental rentals are always rent, rents are going up over time. Just the cost of living, and we're in an inflationary period. If nothing, it's not like we're thinking inflation is going to go to zero anytime soon, right? It's the opposite. <laughs> no. So you know, and we just saw the lumber prices went sky high, and so you know, rental rents have gone up a whole bunch in the last year, haven't they? Oh know. yeah, they've skyrocketed. Yeah, they've gone up a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I mean, so if, as long as that trend keeps up and usually you can expect rent, rents to go up three to five percent a year, I would say, is a reasonable number. And um, and then rent rental values or you could expect them to at least keep up with inflation. And inflation is like three percent. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but over time, over 10 years, don't forget, if you own a rental property, you're not making the mortgage payment. Your tenants are. Yeah. They're paying the house off for you. You know, right. not you. So you just own the property. The only thing you have in it is a down payment you put in and everything else is covered by the tenants, basically. Yeah. That's the way to look at it. So you have if you put down 25% and whatever that house does is based on the 25% you put in, those internal rates of return are pretty astronomical in many cases. Yeah. So um, multifamily properties. If you, you know, this is this is where you know, people people are we're all comfortable doing rental houses, a house. Yeah, I'm I'm in this situation actually. Like a single family home is a very manageable yep. investment situation yep. for me. You get me into an apartment building? <laughs> nope, that is way too much. Can't do yep. it. Nope, I'm not yep. that kind of. Yep. I don't. Yep. Bah, scary. We Tell took, me why that's okay. <laughs> we took the leap about fifth about Ooh. twenty years ago into into um, rental properties. I mean, um, multifamily. And the good thing is, like, if you buy a fourplex or less. Um, Right now, everything's crazy. People are trying to buy everything, but you want to wait. You want to wait until there's a time when people are like, "I'm a little nervous about that." Then you can go in and be picky. But um, when we bought our the the we bought a tenplex, the first thing we bought in 2004, I think, and um, there were tenplexes everywhere. It was in a college town. Everywhere, as far as the eye could see, I wish I would have bought ten more. You know, <laughs> but I got I got the seller. The seller was so desperate to sell that they did seller financing. <sighs> So I borrowed money out of another rental that I had, $100,000. Seems like a bygone thing to me, but. I know. So I borrowed $100,000 out of a rental that I had. I put it down on this on this tenplex that was selling for seven fifty. dollars <laughs> you can believe it. And, this, and the seller financed the other six fifty. dollars Amazing. So really, I put nothing into that house. It came out of a rental that I owned, and we, you know, the Ingrid and I owned, and we put it in this other place. And, and that grew and grew and grew. And then it, the, the, the thing got paid off, and I was thinking, yeah, this, I'm done. This is great. Uh, the, and then the you know the other the real the commercial real estate guy said you're a sap for doing it that way, <laughs> so then I borrowed money out of that and we bought a 24 plex uh, recently about a year ago, and that that thing has grown a ton since you know the last year since we owned it because of the market being so hot, and the rents are going up. So you know now we probably have you know more like 40 uh, percent equity in these properties. It's probably time to buy another 15 percent somewhere else. You know put the money yeah. somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But you could just keep doing it. I have a friend. You might think that's crazy, and some people there just don't want to do it. There's some people listening to this going, "Oh my God, I know, they're it leveraging. What happens when all these chickens come home? They're not going to. Well, they they might come home. They, like, I could really. And then you're back to where head. you started. No houses, no money. I know, right? What's the downside? I'm back where I was. Um, but um, there, a friend of mine bought up. He when we were at Chico. He bought. He started buying little small rental houses in Chico, and at the time when oh. I left, they were like thirty grand. Yeah, these little houses. You know, they rent them to students. And the last time I checked, he had like over a hundred rentals in Chico. Now he's the biggest landlord in Chico. Really? Private guy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. In my fraternity. You gotta have coffee and, with this guy soon. And he's brilliant, you know. Yeah. And he just all he did was kept leveraging and borrowing and borrowing and making the thing bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's a whole business now. And he, I don't know, 
What, what is the average little house cost in Chico? Uh, it's gone up quite a bit since the, like well, since maybe? all of paradise burned down. That market is, yeah. is a kind of an anomaly. Okay, but well, what do you think it would be normally? Oh, like a, you know, your standard three bed, two bath, kind of single family home, not a college rental. It's yeah, let's say the college rentals. Oh, a college rental. Like thing. a junkie college rental. Oh, a junkie. Oh, you're, you know. Yeah, you're looking at four or 500K now on you're those. You're kidding. Yeah. Okay. Those downtown little craftsman houses. Yeah, so he's got, if he's got, if, if he's got a hundred of those, he's worth 40 million. Does he have a hundred houses? Yeah. Wow. Because he's been doing it for 40 years. Wow. So I, gotta, I don't want to say old man, but you know, being gone. For Everyone 40 knows. Years. 40 years I've been out of college at least. So, um, so you know, it's uh, it's a thing. It's just it, over time, time and small rates of return and just continual perseverance, you know, working on this and building your portfolio, um, it pays off. And there's been things I bought that were junk. We bought, like for a few years ago, we bought a, a fourplex in Salt Lake City, believe it or not. And the guy said, it's an up and coming area. It's great, you know, you should buy it. It's good. But it might take you a few years before it becomes a nice area. Well, up and coming. I mean, it there, were there were break-ins, there were break-ins. There were um, people living in tra in, uh, in RVs in the back parking lot that were broke down that you had to go tow away. There were just, okay. oh, I can't even tell you. Is that the place with all the cockroaches Yeah, too? cockroaches. Oh. And the worst thing, the, guy, the thing that got me to sell it finally, should I tell that story? Yeah, you should. Okay. okay. So this was the, this was the, the, the last straw. The editors will cut it out. They don't. This was the last, yeah, the editors. It was the last straw for me. We sent a, uh, one of the tenants called for repair. We sent a, a repairman over. And when he got, he knocked on the door and went in, the, the woman said, oh, get in line. There was a, she was a prostitute and there were lines of men in her living room. <laughs> and she thought this guy was another John. He's just, just a small business owner. I mean, and when I, when I heard about this, You're I'm like, like oh, okay, I can't take, I just can't. Yeah. This, it might That's be up and coming, but it's just not my thing. I can't deal with the, yeah. you know, the level of the quality of tenant that's so here. there's a level of drama too. Like your property manager does come to you when things like this happen. And it's just like, you know, to have yeah. this in your life all the For time, sure. it's a pain. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we so sold the advice, that. What's the advice that we have there? Like, don't do what he did and buy, choose a good area. Yeah. I mean, try to pick, try to pick an area that's good. That will make yeah. sense. You know, the, the, you have to be really cognizant of the, of the, um, the caliber of the people in the area. If it's a high crime area, you know, it could be really a, a challenge to get really good tenants to want to live there. Mm -hmm. So then you end up, the, the, your, your tenant pool is people that are, you know, basically criminals or are comfortable being around criminals and they don't have the highest standards. Yeah. So they can make your life miserable and they did make mine miserable. You know what? But, I love my college student tenants. Yeah. I was really worried about, you know, I, our, the location of our house is right behind, it's like between a Harley Davidson store <laughs> and a Pet Boys. So we always got men who wanted to rent. And, and I was like, ugh. Five boys. I know. I They're going to destroy this house. There, I it's going to be a nightmare. Place. Yeah. And like college students have been the most respectful tenants. Wow. They t and and this is should I even say this out loud? Uh, they're young, right? And they don't know a lot about uh, what's going on in the world. And in general, they tend to kind of honor the lease and pay their rent. They, they wow. don't want to get in trouble, you know, at their young age. Huh. And I think you know, knowing yourself as an investor in the type of people that you're willing to deal with. So, you know, I have young kids. I understand the plight of being a working mom. I could never evict a family. Like in my heart, I just, I would never be able to send a family out onto the streets. This doesn't count you though, you tenants. <laughs> <laughs> no, my tenants yeah. are called, I will, no, yeah. I will evict you, my college student tenants, because I know you can go home to your moms and dads and yeah, everything will be go. fine. Okay, yeah, right. I just know that in my, I'm not, I don't have that. I just can't, I just would never be able to do it. So I told my property manager, College students over families, I need you to prioritize this. Wow, and it's interesting. Just, it's like knowing yourself and what yeah. you're willing to put up with is super important. Yeah. And yeah. I love college town rentals. They turn over more, I think. In my experience, this is totally anecdotal, yeah. but um, they turn over more, but that gives you more frequent opportunities to raise the rent without you know causing problems with your existing tenants. If people don't like that, obviously. Um, and and college students, their expectations are fairly low. So when I do turn it over, a steam on the carpets is bad, is good enough. I don't have to replace the carpets every year, you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. think about who, where you're going and who's gonna be renting your property. It can make a big difference in your life. That's a really good, really good advice for sure. Um, so there's lots of opportunities in the real estate market. And you know, there's the leverage is very cheap. Loans are really cheap. Ugh. They're so cheap right now. They're actually, you know, at or below the long term. I mean, inflation if you've been rate. thinking about it, and like now is the time yeah, to get on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we talked to a lot of clients. I would say that probably 
five percent of clients are willing to do it maybe yeah. most people are very averse to it like no yeah. i've done that before i'm not dealing with tenants and i totally get that and respect that but i want you to know that there are ways to avoid some of the biggest pitfalls that that, that are out there that have caused people to have problems you can actually be in the market have quality tenants have good managers who have good um uh, standards and know the law and work within the law and keep you know they do their interviews and their and their, their um Surveys and stuff to make sure that the people are taking good care of your property. They go in and they do inspections, you know, and it, it can be a lot lower risk than you think. Mm -hmm. And the upside is really, yeah. really um, kind of amazing, especially with leverage. Agreed. You know, leverage adds a lot to it. Go take advantage. So um, what do we forget? This is successful. <laughs> this is accessible to anybody at any yes. age. We just got done talking to a, a, a client and her daughter on the phone. Um, just last week, and the daughter is now looking for a house and making an offer. So exciting. Isn't that exciting? Yes. It's so great so to be able to help people like that. And you know, we you may think that I'm a little bit on the uh, extreme, you know, but I just, you know, it's just a matter of um, how do you look at life? You know, do you look at life as an opportunity where you can just, you know, there's just a million opportunities to do well and set yourself up for, for uh, future retirement. One house, one home, you know, like if the rents go up, um, you say you buy a house for 25% down, more than likely, you're probably just gonna be breaking even at the beginning, right? Covering your bases yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But if the house, if you can raise the rents by five or 10% a year, within a very short period of time, you are making a mm -hmm. ton of money mm -hmm. of rents. And you know, and it just, it makes sense. And you have an income stream when you retire that's relatively retire. fixed. I mean, yep. there are some risks, but. A three-legged stool. Yeah. You don't have pensions anymore. So this is a way to get fixed income, kind of fixed income. Yes. That increases over time without having the money in the stock market. It's an asset you can pass to your children. And you can pass to your children. And if you don't leverage it over and over and over again, right. you may also have equity should you ever need, right. should you ever need cash yep. flow, right? Yep. I mean, there's just, there's lots of. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. The equity doesn't really go away. It's just spread out into more homes. That's true. That's one thing I want to make a point of, you know, yeah, that's yeah, true. you know, um, so, so there's lots of opportunities. We're happy to help you to talk this through, you know, if you want to give us a call or um, yeah. you can certainly ask us questions on our next future podcast. We're going to be doing these on Facebook live soon. Yeah. Send us some questions. We really want to but know what people want to talk about. We would about love here. to know your questions and be able to help you uh, empower you really to get into yeah. this if you want. Yeah. So we look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you. Thanks thank for you listening. For your, thank you for your attention and uh, take care. Bye.